Good morning, everybody out there in internet land. This is Sean Petty coming to you live from San Antonio. Uh, although we have a, a good crew coming to us from all across the country, we have um, Clay and Sharon joining us from the National Center for Families Learning. And uh, they are coming from, you know what? I've, I haven't even asked, goodness. Um, I believe you guys are based in Kentucky. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, we're, in Louisville, we're in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. Okay. I was like, am, am I guessing here? You guys do work <laughs> all across the nation, so I never know, right? Yeah. But, I never know where I am either, Sean, so that's good. We're <laughs> both in the same shape. Oh, goodness. Well, thank you. Thank you for covering me there. It's another it. hotel room somewhere, right? You know, it, it always feels <laughs> okay, but... We also have our crew, um, Elizabeth and Paula uh, from Foundations Inc. And Elizabeth and Paula, where are you ladies today? We're in New Jersey. New Jersey. And Just right outside Philly. Oh, okay. I trust everybody's weather is doing doing decent. We're kind of rainy and cloudy here, but um, how are, how's uh, Kentucky and how's Jersey? <laughs> Kentucky is dreary and cold, and uh, I'm anxious to uh, take a trip to Florida that's coming up pretty soon, you know. I've been tracking the weather there, so I'm trying to ignore the cold and the gray and all of that here. So uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully your weather's a little bit better than that in San Antonio. You know, we're, we're sitting at about 50 degrees, which for us is like winter. Like, we're um, dressed in, you know, sweaters and coats and and freezing, but um, it's at least it's not a hundred, so we're we're grateful for that. <laughs> but how's the weather in Jersey? Uh oh, good, sunny and cold. Uh, sunny and cold. <laughs> sunny yeah. and cold. Well, I know as uh, as Sharon said, uh, we got the Beyond School Hours conference coming up in Orlando, uh, Florida soon, so we're all going to be excited to be down there and uh, enjoying. Hopefully, what's going to be beautiful weather. Yes, we're so excited. It's going to be a great conference. <laughs> I, uh, it I, always it, is. This will be my third, and I, I just really, gosh, I'm just always amazed at, you know, all the people there and their enthusiasm and, you know, the wonderful opportunities for, for professional development. So it's a great conference. And Sharon, uh, this is Elizabeth. Thank you so much for agreeing to participate in the webinar and to, to participate in the panel. We're really excited to put you to work. <laughs> Good. I, I need that, I guess, right? I've been uh, sitting around on my laurels and just coming to your conference. <laughs> uh, it's time for me to roll up my sleeves, right? That's right, right. Thank you. Well, well while, while we're chatting, we're still having folks join us, which is great. We do have um, over a hub over 170 folks actually registered. We'll see you know, how many folks uh, make it today, but whether you're watching this live or whether you're gonna watch it recorded, uh, we have a great, a great talk show in store for you. We're gonna officially begin in about two minutes, but while we're waiting, uh, we just wanna talk a little bit about the technology you're using. So we're using the Zoom platform. We've uh, used Adobe Connect in the past, but this is our first time we're switching over from Adobe Connect to Zoom. And the cool thing is, that Sharon and her team um, are just experts in this platform. So they're actually kind of running uh, the, the show for us today. And, and they have really done a great job of making it just really succinct and beautiful. So we've been working with them to make that happen. So it's gonna be a great, great time. But we're mainly using the chat room today for questions. So if you have questions during um, today's show, please just throw them in the chat room and we'll either answer them directly in the chat room or at uh, certain points of time during today's show, I'll uh, bring them up to Sharon so that she can answer them directly as we're going about. Um, also, if you're in our attendee window, you're welcome to raise your virtual hand. If you do that, that means that you have a question that you would like to ask and I'll try to bring awareness over to it. However, if your hand's been up for a long, long time, we don't want your hand to get tired. So we may uh, lower your virtual hand and try to address you, address that in the chat room. So just FYI on that. If you have any technical difficulties or uh, you're experiencing echo 
a sound or anything kind of crazy like that, go ahead and um, shoot us something over in the chat room and either Paula, myself, or a member of Sharon's team, um, and I believe that's gonna be Mr. Clay Rice, <laughs> will help you. Um, and we'll try to troubleshoot for you through the chat room, try to help you out. Um, I think that pretty much covers all the tech. Uh, is there Paula, Elizabeth, Sharon, do you guys have anything else to add about the technology? No. No, we're good. All right, well, perfect. This webinar is being recorded. Um, so just to let everybody know, uh, once we're done here and it gets transcribed and it becomes 508 compliant, we will post it on the Beyond School Hours uh, webpage, which has a Perspectives from the Field Talk Show webpage where we archive all our past shows. So this will be up there and we'll be referencing uh, for anybody who would like to see it afterwards. But in the meantime, I think I can turn the time over to Elizabeth, who's going to kick us off and get us started. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Elizabeth Siri. I'm the Executive Director of Teaching and Learning at Foundations, Inc. And I just want to thank you all for joining us for another virtual edition of our Perspectives from the Field talk show. Today we are going to continue with our series. Um, it's a discussion about childhood trauma and community resources. I'd like to give a warm welcome to our host, Sean Petty, who is a White Riley Peterson Fellow, and our very special guest, Sharon Darling, President and Founder of the National Center for Families Learning. Sean and Sharon, we just really want to thank you for uh, participating today and taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. But uh, before we start, I'd like to say a special thank you to the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation for making this virtual talk show possible. So without their support, um, we wouldn't be able to bring you events like that. So we really appreciate everything that the Mott Foundation does to support our work. So uh, with that being said, Sean, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you. And we have to actually give kudos to Elizabeth and Paula and Rhonda and the whole team at Foundations Inc. who uh, are out there, you know, fighting for a better life for children across the nation. And that's really um, what we're, uh, what all of us are about is making a better life for kids so that, you know, we can just have a, have a better world all together. And so we appreciate that. We appreciate uh, the warm welcome. It's going to be exciting. We are looking forward to the Beyond School Hours conference coming up in Orlando, Florida, just about literally like a month away, right? Yeah. February 26th to 29th. And so we're, we're very excited. Now, one of the great things about that conference is we're going to do this live. So Sharon is going to be joining our other, um, our other talk show guest. And uh, we just found out that Dr. Sylvia Lyles I'm from the Department of Ed, is going to join our uh, show. You never know where, so, where uh, I shouldn't call her Sylvia, excuse me. You never know where Dr. Lyles is going to pop up, um, and whether it's with a marching band or whether it's her coming out in an astronaut suit. Um, mm -hmm. she, she pops up everywhere. So she's going to join us in our show, and that, that should really complete our show. So I'm really looking forward. It's going to be the fifth year we've done the show. And so it's like our five-year anniversary. So very, very, very excited. For this webinar, though, um, a lot of times I pepper questions in, but uh, Sharon has such amazing content that I really don't want to interrupt her sharing that content. So I'm going to do a lot of my questions in the in the chat room. But everybody out there, you guys know me. I'm going to probably maybe in a couple of slides I'll pop some questions over to Sharon, and she's been uh, kind enough to say that she's going to go with flow and and uh, deal with my craziness. So I really do appreciate that. <laughs> But without further ado, let me turn the time over to you, Sharon. Great, thank you. This is uh, it's a great opportunity for me to, to have, have a chance to talk about really some of the challenges that we face in communities and families as we start talking about the toxic stress that sometimes exists and contributes to the trauma in children's lives as they strive to have a good quality of life in their childhood. So I think as, as we think about that, we at the National Center for Families Learning, always think about a multi-generational approach. So I don't want to talk about just the challenges that we face, but I really also want to talk about what are some of the ways we've learned something over time 
about how we get in the middle of some of this, to look at prevention on the other side and look at it in a bigger picture. So it's not just one generation, but it's multiple generations. So I think Sean, you asked me that, you know, to talk a little bit about how I got started on this multi-generational tour, if you will, 30 years ago, because 30 years ago, um, that that was something that, you know, I was I was teaching elementary school at the time, you know, many, many years before 30 years ago. Gosh, I don't want to go back that far and talk about how old I actually am. I mean, that's really ancient history. But I was teaching elementary school, I was teaching second grade in a very impoverished area. And I was so desperate to help those children learn. And it just seemed like, you know, I, I just wanted the parents to come. I kept thinking if their parents will come, if they'll just, you know, show up for conferences and I can talk to them about what they could do at home, or if they would just let me, let me tell them what they could do to help their children, if they would send them to school on time, if they would send them to school, you know, so that they're ready to learn, I could do so much with them. And if I could just reach the parents. And then something happened in my life and I started teaching adults to read in a church basement. And when I started teaching those adults to read, I realized that those were adults, that I was reaching their children. Those were the ones that I was struggling to, to help their children learn. And I realized then that they were just as at risk as their children, that their lives were in chaos so often, that the things that I took for granted in being a parent, just the necessities of food and you know the things that I didn't have to stress about was really not a reality for them. So I started looking at what could I do to look at a bigger picture in education. You know, how could I think about doing something more holistic with the entire family that would really lift the family up? And at the time I had an opportunity to work at the state level and look at Appalachia because I'm from Kentucky and I'd done national work all across the country in adult literacy. So I came back to my home state and when I looked at Appalachia and I looked at, you know, 70% of the adults that didn't graduate from high school and 60 to 70% of their children who entered in first grade and never made it out 12th grade, you know, what could we do to intervene in the cycle? So I came up with a concept that actually just trying to break down barriers and place them with, with incentives. And so I, I brought children and their parents together on a school bus to a school. So these were three and four year old children that would, didn't typically come to school and parents who certainly didn't typically come to school. But if we really wanted to get the parents out of the hills and hollers, so to speak, we, we really needed to have some transportation for them. So parents and children came together and that was the beginning of this intergenerational family literacy that took off across the country. It won the Harvard Kennedy School of Government Ford Foundation Award after its first year. And you know now the rest is history. We've served uh, 4.5 million uh, parents and children in a very, very intensive uh, intervention around the country since our founding 30 years ago. And we reach 15 million a year with our digital services, um, including Wonderopolis that I'll talk about a little bit later. Wow. So that was really what, what took me on my journey to do this. And so I guess, I guess I could describe myself as somebody when you come in the room at a cocktail party or something, everybody moves to the other side, you know, because, oh, here she comes again and she's gonna tell me about this, this challenge that we have in our families and communities and we have to do something about it. So uh, I've spent my life, really, my life's work on, on really trying to help people understand this, but also in continuous learning. So at the National Center for Families Le Learning, our mission statement says that we er work to eradicate poverty through education solutions for families. And that's really different for an education entity, I guess, to talk about poverty in that way. But, you know, we believe that it is education, that education is the stem of the flower, that no matter what else we do in a community that, you know, whether it's welfare reform or healthcare or education or anything else, economic development in our communities, that it really relies on an educated populace and it relies on children who are thriving. It, the community has to thrive with educational opportunities or we can't really get where we wanna go. So we stay in our lane in some ways in education, but we also get out of our lane some to think about what can we do with the surrounding community and how can we change the trajectory? And I'll talk a little bit more about the relationship of literacy and stress and education in a few minutes. So where are we in the nation? We have a broad reach. So we're in 150 communities where we work deeply with parents and children. We also work um, with 15 million parents and children every year in our digital as well as our on-site programming. 
So what does that mean? It means that we are in diverse demographics, our geographical reach is diverse, we're working with all kinds of families, families from all kinds of circumstances. You know, what started in Appalachia rapidly spread to New York City, to Los Angeles, to Phoenix, and to all the rural communities. So we work with 49 Native American reservations, uh, across communities across the country in 12 states. We've been doing that for the last 28 years now a very deep, intensive work that really tries to intervene in that cycle for parents and children, bringing parents and children together. And we have, from all of these sites across the country, we learn continuously. You know, we want to get better. So we have multiple evaluation and research studies across the country on, on the results of this. And this year, because it was our 30th year, we had an opportunity to take a videographer around the country and really look at the changes that we could see and parents who had been in the program 30 years ago, they now had grandchildren. You know, could we really put our money where our mouth is, so to speak, about saying that if we intervene in this cycle early, can we really see that the next generation can thrive as a result of that? Even though there was, you know, tremendous stress and toxic stress in the community and in the home, can we do something that's gonna do something that will last into the next generations? So we've learned a tremendous amount over 30 years. I sometimes say we're like the air traffic controller. We take a good idea over here in Springdale, Arkansas, and we take it to Los Angeles, or we do the same thing in San Antonio or Dallas and, and take it to New Jersey. So we, we really have learned a great deal. And, and I credit all of those wonderful teachers and people in the field who have, are so dedicated to this approach. So I want to talk a little bit about the parents because I come from the adult education background as well as early childhood background. And so I know you heard me say when I was looking at parents, what I wanted parents to be able to do so that I could do my job. But then when I started working with parents, I realized that I was sending notes home. I was telling them the 10 things they could do to read to their children and be, help their children be successful. And that 30 million of those parents your parents are caregivers, primary caregivers of young children in our country, lack basic literacy skills. And I know that's hard for people to think about when we're focused on children. It's like, you know, these are parents, they're grown people, you know, they ought to be able to cope with these things. They ought to be able to know these things. And we, we sometimes approach them in a way that's very off-putting to them and very scary when we don't have literacy skills. So I think the 30 million is huge. And, and it really means that that low literacy also equates to high poverty. We know that people who are low in their basic skills are four times more likely to be in, unemployed. If they are employed, they make you know, 50 to 60% less. They work part-time. So, so it's a high poverty. It's the likelihood that the low literacy creates the high poverty. And I can tell you about people that I have visited over time. You know, A woman in Atlanta who told me about waking up every morning with her three children looking at her, wanting something from her that she couldn't give them. She had gotten married at, well, she hadn't gotten married actually, she'd had her first child at 13, and here she was 17 years old with three children, and her literacy skills were somewhere around the second or third grade level, and she woke up every morning in a black hole trying to think about how she could climb out and what, how she would ever get the courage to make changes in her own life when she had, you know, felt that there was no hope. So the high poverty really creates a likelihood of toxic stresses for children as well. If you don't have food to put on the table, if you don't know, you know what you're gonna to do to put clothes on your children and you don't know how you're gonna help them succeed in school and you don't know, you know every time the rent's due, you move. And so what can, what can we expect that's gonna happen in those high poverty homes? Oftentimes it's toxic stress or trauma. So poverty-related stress, five time, people are five times more likely to have extreme distress if they're living in poverty. I could go on and on about the statistics. There's the highest percentage of parents reporting parenting stress or parents of deeply poor children. There's economic strain. There's conflict among family members. All of the research tells us the same thing. You know, it, if parents themselves don't feel good about their ability, they don't have hope in their life and they don't have the skills, it, it really compounds itself. And as hard as they try, they can't always provide the kinds of resources that others can provide. I liked this quote from um, 
from a study that I saw, and it's talking about stress, especially harmful to children, that poverty affects all members. But it says interventions to reduce poverty-related stress should be geared toward both children and adults that foster coping skills. These types of interventions buffer against the effects of poverty-related stress and reduce mental health problems, which is exactly what we are doing. That's exactly what we're doing. We're trying to really focus on the intervention that we need to reduce that stress so that the parents can be the parents that they want to be and need to be. But we have to acknowledge that those parents are in just as much stress as their children, that they are just as much in need, and we have to approach them in a way that helps them meet their needs, not just those of their children. So I want to talk a little bit about, I'm going to show you a video clip of Regina, who's somebody that I met actually in the hills of North Carolina, um, now over 30 years ago. And she was um, really so shy and her hair was down in her face. She had three or four, she had three children, I think at the time. And she was really um, desperate to learn. It turned out that she was brilliant. She ended up coming into a program and it changed her life. But we had a chance to catch up with her on our 30 year journey and find out where she is today and what a difference it made in her life. So I wanna have an opportunity just to share a face and a person with you um, so that you get a feeling of what those statistics mean. Switch it again. We were her sidekicks. We grew up being trained to steal and rob and my mother was a felon. So we all had a job to do when we went in a store. Her mother didn't care for females to start with at all. So she kind of took that against her and was very mean to her. Um, physical abuse, verbal abuse. We lived a, a wild life, my three brothers and me. She trained them to fight and to rob and steal. And that's what eventually cost one their life, put the other one in prison and caused the other one to wind up in mental institutions. The difference in my three brothers and me is the family literacy program. I would go to sleep at night and I would hear the sound of the typewriter. And when I would wake up to get ready for school, I would still be hearing the sound of the typewriter. And that moment replays in my mind because many times when there's situations that are difficult or I'm struggling, I literally hear that typewriter. And I'm like, if my mom can be what she was to us and stay up all night long studying and get up and go to school and take care of us every day, I can, I've got this, I can do this. I want them to have a reference point so they can not forget how far we've come because we started here and I went up just a little, just a little. They'll never start there now because they'll start here and their children will start here. And I've witnessed it at my three grandchildren's graduation. So the story of Regina Lynn is repeated across this country with you know now millions of families who had an opportunity, you know, when you look at Regina and talking about her own life growing up, and that she was the one who made it out with her children. You know, one, one of her brothers is in prison, one was in a mental institution, one is dead. And just the trauma that she had experienced in her own life and then her ability to make that change uh, because she knew it was best for her children. She was living with an abusive man who you know, was really not healthy for her or her children. So to be able to make that out, but the opportunity that she took advantage of was called family literacy. And that was something that we've done all over the country. So Sharon, I have to, I just can't keep quiet. I'm sorry, because that's such a powerful story. Did I, did I see that she was living with four children in an abusive relationship in a tent? Yes, that's where she started. And we have others that tell the story of living in a car with her four children, but she was living in a tent and, and her, 
significant other actually held a gun to her and, and tied her in a chair because he didn't want her to go to school and he didn't want her to, you know, do certain things. So it was that, it was that much abuse that those children were exposed to early on. And, uh, and for her to be able to break out of that, and uh, I went to her graduation from college when she graduated uh, at the top of her class from Morris Hill College and then went on to, to further her education. So it's um, the stories like that that keep us going at NCFL. That's, an, that's amazing. When just that one story, I can't imagine the stories that you've seen. And, and it was family literacy that helped break her out of that. Is that what you were sharing? Absolutely, absolutely. So let me just tell you a little bit about our approach because we have an approach um, that's very intensive and that's what you saw Regina going through that really made a huge difference in her life. So that approach is really for those who, who are most in need. Um, I always like to say we try to match the intensity of the intervention with the intensity of the need. And so when we talk about 30 million people who don't have literacy skills who are parents or caregivers, then that's where we really need to start is, is really not just hoping that what we do will trickle down, that you know we can start with all parents and it'll trickle down to the parents who need it most. We really need to start there. And so that's what we've done over the 30 years. So the four components of family literacy are really adult education and that because adults really need to get the basic skills, but more than that, they need to get the courage and you know, to think that they can learn because for many of them, they felt stupid going through school. You know, they moved every time the rent was due and so they never caught up or they you know, didn't go half the time or they, they just felt like you know, many of them ended up in special education. They just felt like they, you know, they weren't worthy, they couldn't learn. And so when their children start to repeat that cycle, they feel like, well, you know, I didn't learn either. Our clan just doesn't learn, you know, we're just not good at education. So to try to dispel that myth and you see them start to come to life when they feel like they can learn and achieve. And then early childhood education. And by that, I don't just mean early childhood education. We're working with this program with middle schoolers in a gang prevention organization in San Pedro, California. We're working in high schools somewhat. Predominantly, we've worked with um, preschool and elementary school students. So you might see the parent actually going into the classroom with their child. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But we want to make sure that the education is good. I mean, I don't want anybody to think that I'm just saying, well, gee, we know that the predominant variable that flows through whether a child will be successful in school is the educational attainment of the parent in the home. That comes through all the time. You know, sometimes it's masked as poverty. But, you know, there really are no poor children in the country. We spend a lot of money on poverty children. But, you know, the children are poor because the parents are poor. And the parents are poor because they don't have skills to get out of poverty. So, you know, it's, it's a cycle that we really have to intervene in. So when we think about that, we know that you can't just close schools and say, well, gee, if that's true, let's just, you know, work with the adults. I mean, we have to have really top-notch education in, in the classroom. And that's what parents can observe. How does the teacher work with my child and how do they talk to my child because I can do that at home. And then the third component is parent time and this is a very powerful time. The parent time is when parents come together and they start to form a bond. So they help each other through learning. They help each other stay with the program because their lives are pretty messy and there's a lot going on. But they help each other so they grow together and they find out about resources in the community. They might be experiencing spouse abuse. They might be experiencing of trauma in their own home. Where do they go to get help? And how do they support each other through some of this? And how do they share ideas? I mean, it's one thing for you, Sean, or for me to, to say to parents, well, here are the 10 things you ought to do to make a successful child. You know, well, we're done with that, you know? But in essence, you know, to try to help parents learn from each other. Because if, if, a, if a parent's in the, my circumstance and they have something else to say to me about what they tried, you know, we heard this in class and I actually tried it last night. You know, I didn't, I didn't slap her or spank her when she couldn't go to sleep. I tried this new way and it kind of worked for me. And then pretty soon that catches on with the other parents and, and that's how they grow. And then the parent child together time is really the secret sauce of what we do. So it's not a matter of parents volunteering in a classroom or you know parents observing their children. They actually spend hands on with their child. So their child helps them understand what it's like how they learn through play. And so it might be that the child plans an activity for the mom that day if they're in preschool. Mom comes in and they do the activity, but then they go back and debrief about it. You know, what did my child learn? And what could I do at home to help the child learn? 
So it's, it's a real direct hit bringing the learning into the home and helping parents see that it's not rocket science. You know, if you're setting the table, you can just be counting with the child or just talking to the child and playing with the child. In elementary school, they actually go into the classroom with their children. So they're sitting side by side with their children, not as observers. They're participating in whatever it is that's going on. So it's been really a wonderful way to see when parents and children start to form a new bond and a new relationship and a new way of working with each other. So it's very integrated, but it looks different in every community. It sounds very rigid. You know, we have this, and we have this, and we have this. It's, there are lots of partners out there that are already doing some of this work and this, these partners can come together to make a holistic approach. But the important thing is that the objectives of adults getting the skills that they need and the confidence, the objectives of children getting a good education and the objective of bringing parents together but most importantly, for parents to learn to work with their own children. I love the holistic approach. Your focus on, on, you know, not just, so many times we focus on either just the child or just the parent, but you're really taking a, you know, a true family group holistic type of change approach. And that's, that's amazing. Well, I think, you know, it is, you get in your own lane, you know, and if you're a, and that's what I was in the second grade. I just wanted these parents to come in and help me with this child, you know, and the same with adults. When you get with the adults, it's like, well, I know, but I don't have time to talk to them about their children's education. But I think if we look bigger, and it was funny to, you know, that you would say that because I have a good friend who's a pediatrician um, of some renown, and I was trying to tell her about, you know, getting involved with the parents as well, and, you know, they don't read, and they need literacy skills, and she said, what don't you understand about me being a pediatrician? I got into that because I don't like adults. I like children. <laughs> I said, well, okay. And I think she was, you know, tongue in cheek, but I, but I do think it's hard to, to, because you have so much to do to try to educate a child or an adult that you really don't have much of a, an opportunity to step back and look at a bigger picture. But we've made that easy for people to do. I mean, we've had enough experience with this that, you know, even if it's not a full blown family literacy program, we can help people move to the next level. You know, how do you get a little bit deeper into the parent engagement space? If you're a Title I teacher or an out after school provider, or, you know, if you're in a library or, or a nonprofit organization. So there are five key protective factors that the Strengthening Families um, Center for the Study of Social Policy has. And I want you to think about what happened with Regina and what I talked about with the four components when you look at parental resilience social connections, knowledge of parenting and child development, concrete support in times of need, and social and emotional competence for children. All of those factors guide the work that we do because we have to accommodate the parents and help them. I often think about it, you know, the way they used to talk on an airplane, you know, if you load, you know, get on the airplane and they say in case of an emergency, the oxygen mask will drop from the ceiling. And if you're seated next to a child, you should put the oxygen mask on your nose and mouth first before you help the child. And that's really what we're trying to do is giving the parents the skills and the knowledge and the confidence and the motivation to help their own children. I want to just show one other clip of a parent because I think when we talk about parents learning from each other and how powerful that is and how important that is, uh, Banika actually uh, is a good example of that. And she wasn't in the program very long when, when, she, uh, when we shot this, but I just thought she was really a good person to uh, talk about how the small change maybe that it made in her life, but what that could mean for the toxic stress in the home. At first, I didn't want to come this because I didn't want to open up. Okay, so with my past of me growing up in a foster home, never had anybody to vent to, um, I came to this class last week and I learned some tools. How to wake up my kids in the morning without cussing them, like get the hell up and all that. So now, this last week, she told me to go home and do the homework back. I did. I never hugged or kissed my kids or nothing to that extent. So now, uh, me sitting and reading that little poem book, they hug, they kiss me, they tell me they love me now. We, we're doing more family outings in the last week than ever. Never went to do any library cards, no nothing. Um, it's always me screaming at them because I didn't know how to deal with it. 
with me. To me, this is like a step out to go home, to take some of these tools home, and to show them it's another way than to always me be angry all the time towards my kids. Right. They didn't ask to be here. It's my duty to get myself together, let all my pain and hurt go, so I can be a better parent for my kids. So that's why I'm sitting in this class, so I can better me and my kids. <laughs> So I think that tells the story of just small changes that can really make such a huge difference in somebody's life. So if you've never been parented in a way that's healthy, you know, if you've lived with parents who themselves were, you know, very stressed and your upbringing uh, really was a hard one, it's hard for you to know anything other than that. I mean, that's the way you were parented. And so to, to help parents start to get the confidence that they can do something different, you can imagine the other women in that room, you know, now they're thinking about, well, you know, maybe I'll try to do a little bit more of that. It seemed to work for her. So I think it's, um, it shows pretty well what, what those components are all about and what changes can be made. I love, so I want to talk, uh-huh, go ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting. I just had to, I love how real she was. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, she was like, I never hugged or, or kissed my kids. I, you know, I didn't get them up in the morning without cussing at them, you know, and, and then for her to talk about that so openly with others and be like, and now I'm coming here and I'm learning a different way. And, and we never went on family outings, but now we're doing that. I mean, gosh, what a, what a powerful, powerful movement. Yeah. We just don't think about that all people don't think that way or, you know, because they haven't been raised that way. And, and sometimes it's difficult. So, I, I mean, we just take it for granted. Well, of course you wouldn't do that. Of course you wouldn't do that. But it's not that easy um, for parents who have never experienced that to really put that in place. And I guess I'll say also that it really, for what it does for their children is amazing. You know, we've, over the years, have had so many research and evaluation studies. I mean, I think the, the Native American population, when we work on that, that, that area, that's, those are some of the most challenged families in, in our country, for sure. And, you know, they have a history of people taking their children away and putting them in boarding school and trying to destroy their culture. And this program has been so important to them because they have said, you know, you, you don't tell me that, you know, I don't have any role in my child's education. You're telling me I have a huge role and you're going to help me fulfill it and not just, you know, take them away from me and teach them because I don't have much to offer. So embedding the culture in the work that we do on the Native American reservations, but I can tell you, Sean, that We've had an outside independent evaluation on that program for 28 years, and we have 49 sites. So you can imagine that we have a rich, rich uh, data set that tells us what's going on, and it's just been amazing. I mean, children who were in special education, you know, destined for special education with an IEP, you know, it, it's cut in half by the time they get to school. And those that were maybe the 11th or 12th percentile one year, that was where most of the children scored on the nationally normed test. And by the time they finished the program, they were up to the average, you know, 50 or 55th percentile in terms of, of their learning. So it was just to watch what can happen if you really look at a family and start to change the home and the family, it's just truly amazing. So we've been so excited and I'd love to, you know, if you want more information on any of the research that we have, but that's a huge, you know, having an outside independent federal evaluation on something for 28 years and finding the same results every year for both the parents and the children is pretty astounding. I mean, this should be, this should be national news. I mean, you, this should be proclaimed on every news channel. What you're talking about is massive change over a long period of time with proven results that are, that's not only helping to eradicate poverty, change people's lives, but help, you know, with some of the tensions that are, historical in our country. I mean, wow. Yeah. If we can help change the home and the family, I mean, that's the most basic unit. And if we can do that and help that be a positive experience, our communities are going to get strong and healthy. I mean, there's just no question about it. So it, it ripples out and, you know, our schools, everything that, that we care about in our communities and our society really depends on that. We really have to have the upbringing that the children need, the kind of opportunities that, that can be presented to them when their parents start feeling like they have some positive influence on their children. That, that brings me to family service learning because that's something that we've initiated about five years ago. We're in 
I think 40 cities and 13 Native American reservations with this initiative, because that's the way we do our work. We look and see what, what's going on and what, what else can we contribute? You know, now we know this, but what else do we need to learn and how else do we need to, to really address this issue? So family service learning grew out of what we saw oftentimes, and that is that parents in the program, you know, we would take them to a certain level and many of them would go ahead with their lives, but you know, and some of them would become leaders in their communities or in their schools, but we weren't doing anything to deliberately look at that and say, what can we do to enhance that? Because that's what we need. You know, we need people on the ground, we need to hear their voice and we need them to solve problems because they're the ones, the ones closest to the problems in their community are the ones who have the closest solutions to it. You know, it's not just people say to me, well, what's the one thing we could do? And I think, yeah, there's not one thing. You know, it's a lot of things. So. We started looking at parents and we researched what might happen to develop those skills and we researched service learning and we didn't find anything that was family service learning, you know, where parents and children were planning together what they would do in their community. And then we've had a long history with Toyota. They've given us over $50 million over time to do our work across the country and they have systems in place. You know, they have problem solving systems they use throughout the world. So I thought, well, you know, we could, we could take that same system and apply it to the work that we do. So that's what family service learning did. We really can look at, we, we start with a six step process. It's not anything about just give a day of service or go clean up the you know, trash. It really is a way to help parents get skills that they can use in their life. You know, whether it's employment skills because we do a lot of the soft skills work or it's really problem solving skills. You know, how do they start to learn how to not just think about tomorrow, but to problem solve something so that they can put something in place that will last and be sustainable. So the way that works is parents come together. They, they have to decide on what they would like to solve in their community. We listen to their voice. It's their voice that guides it. Then they have to come to consensus. So they have to learn to work as a team. And then they have to plan. You know, they have to go and research and learn computer skills about who's doing what and what are the statistics about it. And then they start to think about how they would implement a plan and who else they would need. So they, in essence, almost do what we would call a business plan. You know, how are we going to need more people in the community to do this work with us? For example, in the Bronx, they were um, worried that the immigrant population was very, very distant from the police and they feared the police. And so the police came and talked to them. They did a safety walk together. The parents had already done the safety walk and they identified places in their community where there was no lighting or there were adults on the playground with no children and you know all the things that they were so fearful of for their own children. And then the police and the parents did safety walks together. And then they talked about how they could solve some of the problems together. You know, whose role was it to start to solve those and what role could these parents play? And it became a whole different community. Some people were cleaning up beaches in San Pedro because of all the needles and, you know, they went to Home Depot and got contributions and, you know, you heard parents saying things like, well, I thought we'd get in trouble for doing anything like this, you know, because the city's supposed to do it and we might get in trouble. So just helping parents start to take ownership of their community, but the beauty of it, Sean, is that we have, we have children with them. So what is that saying to children that, you know, I can do something in my community? We own this community. It's our problem, not just the community's problem. And it just, it's a whole other way, a whole other layer of creating the next generation of people. But it's literacy. You know, we did a vocabulary initiative in Detroit. We had money uh, to, to really use this approach to teach vocabulary to both parents and children. And it was amazing. I mean, we, were, we could see the, the difference in the, these were young children. And when they went to school, and how much better prepared they were because of the vocabulary that they had practiced and gained. And so it, it fits in a lot of places. It's not just, you know, it doesn't have to just be family literacy. It fits perfectly into, you know, any kind of an approach that libraries might take or after school programs might take or summer programs might take. But what it does is it creates a learning opportunity for parents and children that doesn't exist in a vacuum. So we've shown just great results. The first year, 54% of the parents got a job or a better job. And we thought, oh, we're not even thinking about jobs. And they started building social capital. They had community networks. They met other people. They started to expand their horizons a little bit. And that was only beneficial for the child. So that's one of the things we're doing now um, with family service learning is 
working across domains, I guess. So we go into communities and we actually do com community building. So we bring together, for example, in Dallas, we have a coalition of I think 42 nonprofit organizations. Some of them feed people, some of them do um, you know, homelessness, but how, how can we all look together at a, at a multi-generational approach? You know, what can we learn from that? And how can we take what we're doing and just kind of move, it, move the needle a little bit? So family service learning has become an organizer there and there are 52 parent ambassadors that work in the community to really go out and help. And then the family service learning model, the first cohort that goes through of families comes back the next year and mentors the families coming through. So we start building community. And a lot of them are focused around schools. You know, so they want to they want to do something in schools. Like in Detroit, they worked on bullying because they felt like that was something that their children were experiencing in the school. So they work right along the side the administrators and the teachers. So that's um, one of the initiatives we have, as well as the city and community-wide approaches that we're using now across the country, trying to help all people come together to look at multiple generations. So Sharon, I have a, I have a question that's uh, been brought up to me through the chat room, and that is, you know, so how does, how does an organization uh, get engaged in, in some of the work that you're doing? Like, if I was, you know, in Dallas and I wanted to uh, become part of this uh, family service learning uh, or, or some of the work in the multiple areas that you, you work in, how do, how do we go about doing that? Just reach out to us, you know, reach out to me. We have all kinds of free resources and we're in so many communities that we could engage with, um, you know, and bring people in from other, from other parts of the education system or the community system. So just, just reach out to us and we can, you know, we can put you in touch with people in your community who are doing this work, or we can help you think about how we could come in and, and help you as well. We do a lot of training and technical assistance. We do, um, Title I schools, we have 103 Title I schools right here in Louisville where we're working on deep parent engagement, taking, taking schools where they are and then thinking about where they want to be. So some schools are pretty good at it, others are just getting started. So how can we move the needle? So it's not, as I said, you know, for those most in need, we feel that the intervention needs to be substantial and that's what we do in family literacy. For others, it might be a, a different approach, but We've spent 30 years now uh, doing this work. We also work on policies. So I could tell people out there across the country that, you know, we have cleared cobwebs. So we are always on the hill. If there's any piece of legislation about children or adults or community service, community service block grant, adult education, vocational education, we're there putting this approach in that legislation so that by the time the money gets to the communities, it's not mandated but people can start to put their resources together a little bit different. We go into a community, we see an innovation, and then our goal is to get other monies to really support that innovation after we leave and to sustain it. Because if we're showing that it's doing better than what they're spending their money on now, um, most of the time that's what they want to do. So we've been really pleased about our progress in that way. That's, that's awesome. Now I, I'm, I'm so caught up in all the, the, the stories and the, the impact that you're having that I've kind of lost track of where we are in the pre presentation, but this is a good point because I was just about to ask you, what about resources? So if I'm, I've posted your website up in the chat room and everything, but I know you said you have tons of resources for people. So can we take a few moments and chat about those? Absolutely. We have all kinds of, we offer a lot of webinars, you know, training webinars and you know, informational webinars here at NCFL too that are free that you can sign up for. We have all kinds of research studies that, you know, if somebody's trying to make the case for this kind of an approach to education, we have ways that we talk about that. We have fact sheets, but we have resources for parents. You know, we have all kinds of resources. And one of the resources that I think is particularly appropriate for summer programs or out of school time programs is Wonderopolis. Wonderopolis is a great website. It's um, every day we have a new wonder of the day. So we're in the daily publishing business. We reach about, well, 1.2 million people, unique users every month with this platform. So it's all over the world. It's in, I believe, uh, 28 or 30 languages. So you can you know, just hear it in your own language or see it in your own language. Um, there are words that you, know, you can highlight and get definitions on, but 
it's fun. We did it so that we wanted to create um, a, an atmosphere of creativity and learning and the wonder that children have in learning. So it's a great resource, but all of those wonders are archives. So if you have a particular thing you want to work with your children on that day, or you know it's lightning outside, you can just go to Wonderopolis and say, well, what do we know about lightning? So the first one, for example, was why are flamingos pink? And you know that was how it started. Then there's a little short video, and then it then it says, "Have you ever wondered?" And then it has all of these questions, and it keeps going deeper and deeper. And and then ultimately, it has maker activities uh, attached to it. So why don't you try this out? And so there are all kinds of things that you would have in the home or you'd have at school. You know, they're easy to make. And then it also says, if you're still wondering, it'll take you to a Smithsonian site or elsewhere to get more information on it. So it's and, and right now we're in a process of creating the materials that go along with it for after school programs and for Title I schools. So we can do training and, and help people make a whole curriculum out of it. I mean, it's easy to do for a summer program or an after school time program and it's fun. So I, I just have to interrupt and share a story. I mean, I'm, because so for all of our listeners on, online today or anybody listening to the recording, um, Sharon and I were having a, a call and we were talking about this. And um, I don't know if you remember, Sharon, but you gave me a great idea. And that is um, how many times do we sit down and we know that family dinner or, or sitting as a family for dinner is an important time to communicate with our children sometimes as, as parents, right? And but how many times is it awkward? Like, especially when you have teenagers, because like I have a 14 year old diva and um, she loves to sit down at the dinner table and we, we have a rule like you got to put your phone up, but sometimes, you know, she's like, oh, my phone, I got to get back to it. So we're sitting there and I, I always ask, you know, so how was your day at school? And they're like, uh, yeah, it was great, fine. And so Sharon recommended going to Wonderopolis and looking at the wonder of the day and uh, or the the you know special thing of the day. like today's is how simple is Occam's razor or the question that uh, Sharon said the very first one you know why are flamingos pink so I did this with my family and we sat down and it was so funny because when I asked them a question like you know how was your day at school I get a one word answer or a two word answer but when I asked them something like, you know, uh, how simple is Occam's razor? All of a sudden it's like, what is that? What are you asking me? What is Occam's razor? It's like, okay, well, let's find out, you know? So based on your suggestion, I had like a 30 minute conversation with my own kids <laughs> at the dinner table. And what, what a great resource for parents who sometimes are at a loss to communicate with kids. And one of the questions in the um, chat room is, is, is it for all ages? And I'll throw that out to you, Sharon. What do you think? Do you think it's for all ages? Wonderopolis? Yes, ma'am. Yes, absolutely. We have kindergarten teachers using it. Um, so it's, it's the language itself is, is more geared. I would say the sweet spot is probably third grade through maybe high school. I mean, some of the, some of it gets a little bit harder, but um, you know, it, it can be read to you as well. I mean, you can just push a button and it can be read to you and it can be in any language. So for parents who don't speak English, they can get it in their own language as well. And then they can have work with their children in maybe English. So it's, it has, it's multifaceted, but everybody can participate in it. I mean, it's not just for, you know, a, a certain age group. But we found that you know middle schoolers love it. Those children in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade love it. High schoolers too. I mean, as you said with your with your daughter, you know, it's it's a fun thing, and uh, and you can just pick out a wonder. Everybody could pick out a wonder, you know, a different night. So I'm going to stump you on this wonder, because the beauty of it too is that the parents don't know the answer either. You know, so it's fun for everybody to investigate, and you know. Here in Kentucky, it's, you know, we ride a lot of horses because we have the Kentucky Derby. So it's derby time, it's do all jockeys ride horses and it shows a jockey on a horse, but then it talks about disc jockeys and it talks about all kinds of jockeys. And so it's a, you know, it's just a fun way to, 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 uh, to talk, but it also is very, um, you know, we have an educator's guide to it. So a lot of Title I schools, a lot of other people are using it because it is substantial. We have it, um, we have it correlated to the common core standards and to state standards across the country. So that if you 
really want to reinforce some of the learning uh, that's going on in the classroom, it's easy to use the wonders. You know, we have them all archived, we have them categorized. So it's, it works for so many audiences. And is it free? It's absolutely free. It's, it's just free. You can just go on and take advantage of it. You know, we like to think um, if you're going to use it as, you know, something beyond that, like in the after school programs or the summer programs, that it would be good to take advantage of the materials that have lesson plans with them and have the maker activities, what you would need for the maker activities, so that it becomes turnkey and easy for people that, you know, maybe are not as used to teaching in a classroom. I love it. I lo and I love the fact that you can become like a, a, is it called a wonder spot or a hot spot for wonder? Yeah, a hot spot for wonder. And, and also, you know, we get the wonders from people's nominations. So these are wonders from children and classrooms. And, you know, if we use their wonder, then we give them credit for it. So whole classes will come together and decide on, you know, what they're wondering. So it's always a, what are you wondering about? And, uh, and try to then acknowledge that. And we, we answer everybody who, who talks to us. I mean, if they have a question for us, we, it's, it really is a heavy lift for us um, as an organization, but we think it's really a valuable resource. We use it in adult education too, to help adults learn. So it's, it's a real good learning tool, I think. I'm just kidding. And we also have the National Literacy Directory, which is yeah. up there, the NLD.org. So we, um, we are fortunate enough to have an opportunity through Dollar General Foundation to have every literacy program and GED testing program, library program, anything in the country that has to do with literacy for adults and children and also for adult literacy. We, you can just log on, put in your zip code and it'll tell you all the programs that are in your area. Many of the programs post their results, they have their hours and so it's a real easy way if you're in a position to refer someone uh, to some help, it's a real easy way to find out where that help is. And uh, we, it's well used by, you know, even the federal agencies because it's so comprehensive. And we also have training there for volunteers. So if you want to be a volunteer in a program, um, you can go there and get some pointers on that and what it might look like if you went into a school or elsewhere. You know what I love about the National Literacy Directory that you've also created on there, um, besides the fact that it, it guides you to uh, resources, because, you know, in 2019, they just reported that Americans went to libraries more than ever before in 2019. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's a great accomplishment for our nation. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. But I love the fact that you also put up funding opportunities, don't you? Mm -hmm. Right, we do. And that's another thing that's on our website, too, is that we often have grants. I mean, we have grants to help innovation in communities. We have grants for, you know, the National Literacy Directory. If you have a good idea and you want to implement it, um, you know, they might be smaller grants with the National Literacy Directory. They might be huge grants and in coming into a community for three years to start family literacy programs or family engagement. So, you know, it's important to stay tuned with us. We have blogs, we have, you know, Facebook, and we have all kinds of ways to connect. But you know, it's not just about finding our resources, it's about, um, you know, there are all kinds of ways that you can connect and find out what's going on in your own community so you can connect with that if you think it would be useful. So we have there up on the screen um, ways to connect with us and please do that. I mean, we, um, we have an annual conference as well and uh, that usually, I think this coming up conference is going to be in Dallas. And so that's going to be in October. And we're excited about that. We're going to, to Sean's home territory in Texas. So. Well, and I understand you have a call for proposals open right now as well, like for speakers. We do. And we would love to have, have a, a, an, a broad audience because what we have is really, we have people from all kinds of aspects of literacy or education or libraries, but all of them are looking toward how do I do something more holistic? And so we have just, we have great sessions and great keynote speakers. So I would encourage you to come and I hope that we can have a reciprocal kind of agreement with, uh, you know, us participating too with some of the work that you're doing, Sean, and some of the work that Foundations is doing. Because I think it's, you know, we really need to see how these pieces fit together. Well, I love, I'm going to go back into um, something you said um, that I put in the chat room is a good point. And it's, there's not just one thing we can do. There are many, there are a lot of things we can do. And I think uh, you, Sharon, your organization, all the, the individuals who are helping you with this amazing mission, 
are doing that and changing the lives of individuals like Regina. And, and I, I, your second uh, video, I forgot her name. I apologize. Benika. 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 I mean, it's amazing. Just those two stories. And, and, and you said you have so many, along with your 49 various um, sites in Native American tribal lands, you know, the work you're doing there. That's amazing. I mean, um, I encourage you to look at our YouTube channel uh, because we did, as I said, we went back 30 years. And so on our YouTube channel, we have videos that are short, just like the, you know, there's Regina's is a little bit longer than that on the YouTube channel. But, you know, if people really want to tell this story to decision makers or funders about why they want to get deeper into parent engagement, um, they're really great. And, uh, and for me personally, after starting it 30 years ago, to be able to go back and really see the difference in people's lives and the difference now in their children's lives because they took advantage of this opportunity um, is really astounding to me. So I hope that it will be impactful as you saw on the video clips that we had. Well, I mean, on behalf of youth development workers who work in the space, let me just say thank you. I mean, um, I, oh, we do have a question, I'm sorry, in the chat room. Are any of these parent stories translated into Spanish or, or different languages? Um, I don't think that we have them translated into Spanish. Some of the Spanish speakers did speak in Spanish and we, have, we actually do have a lot of, of our keynote speakers, parent speakers at conference who speak in Spanish and we have interpreters for those. So I'm, I'm sure we have those and I could direct this person to the ones uh, that would be in Spanish. But we do, you know, our languages, we, we believe in language justice. So we don't do anything, whether it's a parent meeting or a coalition meeting or anything else without interpreters. We just believe that people have a right to express themselves in their own language and they have a right to hear um, a language that they can really comprehend what's being said and not just try to translate in their own head. So we would have quite a few of those. Thank you, I appreciate that. There's so much value in, in various languages, particularly if it's your native tongue, you know, having something in your native tongue is so critical. The comment in the chat room, you know, is um, to please if you could share those resources and, and Sharon has opened the door for you to reach out to her and her organization as well. So um, uh, the comment was, I work with 41% Spanish only um, mm -hmm. in the chat room. So definitely reach out. I think Sharon and her team. Yeah, and I think uh, probably 60% or more of our programs that we work with across the country are Spanish speaking or um, I think Spanish speaking or immigrant populations. So, you know, that that's a sometimes really challenge for parents who come here from other countries who, you know, really don't connect with the schools in the same way. I mean, they may come from a country where it's not even allowed or appropriate for a parent to go to a school and talk to a teacher or ask questions. And so trying to overcome some of those barriers that, um, that exist with some of our immigrant populations. But we're, uh, we're excited about what we've seen. So I could go on and on about stories of immigrant populations who've um, just achieved great things like, you know, the Maldonados, I just have to tell that story. They're in LA and they just, they, I met them when their son was living in a basket um, 30, over 30 years ago and um, they were from Mexico and they didn't have running water or anything. They lived in the garage and their, one of their sons uh, graduated with highest honors from UCLA in math. The other one is now, he's in film and he did an internship with Morgan Freeman and he's now the associate producer for Framework which is the production company out in, I think, Burbank. So it's amazing to see what's happened with that family. So I hope that people will start thinking about this in a different way and we can help. Well, uh, we are, I, wow, that, I mean, that was perfectly done. We're right at time. So um, thank you so much for your message, for the information, for the amount of resources that you're putting. Um, some of our folks in the chat room are sharing with each other some of your resources already, uh, the YouTube channel, um, the various stories you have. So this is great. I would encourage um, everyone to check out, uh, you know, the website, check out the YouTube channel, take a look at uh, Wonderopolis. I think you'll find it really 
you know, fascinating. Also check out uh, the National Literacy Directory, um, which is going to be, you know, which is an amazing uh, resource as well. Just so many things. And then I would, I would encourage you, come meet Sharon in person at the talk show. She's going to be at the Perspectives uh, talk show at the Beyond School Hours Conference in Orlando, Florida. Um, also, she has uh, the conference happening in Dallas, I think in October, if mm -hmm. I'm correct. Yes. Uh -huh. And so check out on uh, the National Center uh, for Families Learning webpage. Uh, the very first page, I believe, uh, will show you the conference in Dallas, which is happening um, October 19th through the 21st. And they do have a call for proposals open right now. So, you know, definitely if, if you want to share your story and add to this movement, please do so by signing up to do that. Hopefully you'll be selected. Um, but most importantly, um, please, everyone on the line, take an opportunity to really uh, use these resources to help all of us in our mission to eradicate poverty and to make the lives of families as a whole, um, which comes in many shapes and forms, uh, but families as a whole just have a better life all together. So um, I will end us. Well, well, let me ask Sharon, any final closing thought, burning thought that we can get in in this last like 30 seconds? Give it a try, you know, start thinking about a holistic approach. Give it a try. Start thinking about a holistic approach. That's going to be our mantra. So everybody remember <laughs> it. Uh, use that. A special thanks to the Charles S. Uh, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, which actually funds our talk show, and all those foundations, such as the um, a Dollar General uh, Literacy Foundation, as well as Toyota, who helps fund uh, some of Sharon's work uh, and her team's work. So a big thanks to those who like the Mott Foundation put those amazing dollars in places where it really makes a difference. So thank you. Um, thank you. With that, I think we'll go ahead and close us out. What a great show. Thank you, Sharon. And, and Clay, a big, uh, he's behind the scenes. We haven't seen him yet, but Clay Rice has been running all of our uh, tech today, making sure everything was smooth and nice. Also a big thanks to Paula and Elizabeth with Foundations for keeping us going and, and making this just wonderful. So thank you all. And I think we'll go ahead and close out and see you in Orlando. I'll see you soon, Sharon. Thank you. See you soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.